Well, good morning on this wonderful Lord's Day. Um, uh, what is that big tower thing over there with the clock on it? Is that a church? What is that? Memorial Union. Oh, Memorial Union. That's all it is. Oh, good. So it's a secular. They have coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, good. Okay. So it's a, Mi a Missouri landmark or something. Uh, uh, well, it's very attractive. So I told some my friends I was coming to Missouri to give a talk, and they said, do people get together? And I said, yeah, uh, Missouri loves company. So, uh, <laughs> um, so we have a, a radio show. Um, Free Thought Radio, which was just mentioned. Free Thought Radio is produced in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in our, we're almost at 10 years. April of 2006, we started Free Thought Radio. Annie Lori Gaylor and I are co-hosts. And so next month will be our 10 year of Free Thought Radio. And it broadcasts right here in Columbia, Missouri. There's a radio station, KOPN, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I don't know what times it broadcasts. Does anyone listen to it? Uh, I think it's at 1, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock? Yeah. Like on Sundays or? Uh... Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday? Okay. Wednesday. Well, anyway, you can hear it at least once. And uh, the fellow John, what's his name, uh, the program director, is always a lot of fun. He likes getting the feedback from the show. So listen to it and contact the station and tell them you really like having the show on. Because they like to hear from listeners. What do listeners want? So call them up and say, this is great. We'd like to hear more of this kind of stuff. And we're trying to get on more stations. We're only on about... 10 or 12 actual broadcast stations around the country, um, in, including in Madison, Wisconsin, on Saturday mornings, and then uh, Grand Rapids and uh, New York State, um, Central Texas, where Texas A&M is, um, and a bunch of other places around the country. But the podcast is a big deal these days. People like the podcast because you can listen whenever you want, when you're exercising or or still not even up yet in the morning, or whatever. Uh, and people walk to work and they listen to it. And one guy came up to the booth, I was at uh, the Reason Rally. He said, so you're Dan Barker. When I hear your voice, I start exercising. <laughs> because he's always listening to our show while he's exercising, so that's kind of cool. So um, Sasha is a student group associated with the Secular Student Alliance and uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Uh, likes to support student activities, and we have been for, for many, many years. We have three student essay contests. So how many of you students would like $3,000? Would you like it for your college? You can get it by winning uh, one of our essay contests. We have one for high school seniors going on to college. We have one for college students going on to college. And we have one for grad students or mature, 25 or older. So we announced them this year, uh, we usually announce them in February, and if you're a good writer, you have good chances, because we don't get thousands, we only get like one or two hundred a year, and I got to tell you, half of them are kind of crappy, um, because they're just dashing them off. So if you're a good writer and you put some thought into it, you have really good chances of winning. We have six places, a $2,000 second place, a $1,000 third place, and then some honorable mentions in that. So uh, I encourage you to look online on our website, uh, ffrf.org, for student essay contests. The topics vary each year. It usually has to have, usually involves something personal about you. Because we've had problems in the past, and surprise, surprise, even, even non-believers will do this. We've had problems with plagiarism. We, we were just about ready to an award a wonderful essay, a first place prize. Really well written and well thought out. And one of our admin staff looked it up online and found that it was pretty much word for word just copied from someone else's research. So what do you call that? Um, theft, I guess. But So don't do that. Write your own article. Put your own thought into it. And um, uh, it could be why I'm a non-believer or why state and church should be separate. Uh, we, also, uh, we also have like a subcategory for people of color, non-believers of color. And a lot of them enter as well. Uh, the challenges of being a minority and a non-believer as well. So um, enter that contest. This year is an election year, and the Freedom From Religion Foundation has a campaign called I'm Secular and I Vote. We are non-political. We're a non-profit organization, so uh, we don't advocate for, any, for or against any candidate uh, or make endorsements. But we do think it's important for the non-believers even though we're not a cohesive group, at least we are a presence, and we're a fast-growing presence. And I think the media and politicians uh, 
are ignoring us. They're giving all this attention to believers, right? What is the evangelical vote? What is the Christian vote? But when are they coming to us to ask, what, is, what are our views? So we have, um, we have some free stuff on the back table. I know students like free stuff. Um, take one of these uh, bumper stickers that says, I'm secular and I vote. If you're a student, take one for free. If you're not a student, it's uh, $50. Uh, but, uh, and then there's some buttons that say, I'm secular and I vote that you can take. What is that? Oh, that's the time. Okay. So, uh, and then also a free copy of our newspaper, um, Free Thought Today, which comes out 10 times a year. This is, um, this is volume 33. So this is our 33rd year of um, publishing Free Thought Today. And uh, we talk about state church separation mainly. The Freedom from Religion Foundation exists. Is it hard when I'm walking around like this? Uh, is that, uh, I'm make, give him a hard job. I'm going to run around back. Um, so, um, so the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which I joined in 1984, uh, the same year that uh, I met Annie Laurie Gaylor on the Oprah Winfrey Show, which is really fun. You can go online and see that, by the way. We showed our daughter... Um, Sabrina, she's 26 now. We showed our daughter a couple years ago. We showed her the video of, that, of the day her parents met. We actually met that day. And you can kind of see us on the show kind of checking each other out. You know, it's kind of like, oh. Uh, that was the first time I had ever knowingly met uh, an outspoken atheist. We've all met atheists in our lives, but to, to actually know it. It was on that show where I met Annie Laurie and Ann Gaylor. And later, Annie Laurie and I got married, so her, our daughter got to see the day her parents met. And she was laughing, not so much because we were so young and I had lots of hair and all that, but uh, that audience that, that Oprah had um, packed with Bible believers, and it was really great. It was, you know, I used to be a preacher, and so when you're a preacher, you're usually speaking to a sympathetic audience. Usually people are coming because they want to worship, and they love what you're saying, and they say amen, right? That was the first time I ever spoke before a hostile audience, and I loved it. It was, it, was, it was incredible. It was like, wow, now now you're saying something that's actually making a difference. It's not just, yes, we love you, we appreciate it. It's like you're saying something that's ruffling feathers. You're being a troublemaker. You're actually uh, mixing it up. You know what I mean? And it was good TV. The producers of that show put in a whole bunch of people with their big, thick Bibles sitting in the front row and one woman in the audience was calling Annie Laurie a witch, you know, like, which was, and then Annie Laurie leans forward and says, oh yeah, you know what the Bible says about witches? She didn't. She said, well, you have a Bible, you should read it. You know, you should actually read your Bible. Uh, that was really fun. And, I, and then we all looked at each other and we said, yeah, this is our people. This is, this is who we like to be with, the people who, who want to be troublemakers, who want to challenge the status quo, who want to mix it up, who want to ask questions, who want to throw some doubt and who want to spread some skepticism around and, uh, and see what happens, you know. And often they've come back fighting with you. And, and so once in a while, somebody will stop. I never heard any criticism before. So uh, since 1984, I joined the foundation. In 1987, I went to work full time for the foundation after a few years as a computer programmer. And then um, found, uh, really found a home there. The Freedom from Religion Foundation works and we're in Madison, Wisconsin. We work to keep state and church separate and to educate the public about the views of non-theists, whatever that means. You can call yourself an atheist or an agnostic or a secular humanist or, you know, some people don't even like to be an ist. One guy calls himself an atheian because he doesn't want any isms in his life. Or you can call yourself an igtheist or whatever. We don't care what we call ourselves we all disbelieve in the same God, so it doesn't matter. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty cool. And politically, we all differ. It doesn't follow that if you're an atheist, you're necessarily a liberal. Although most of the people in our group, 70 to 80 percent of our group identify as progressive liberal, there are some strong conservatives who are atheists and agnostics too, pro-guns and anti-abortion and pro-death penalty. The table talk at our conventions is very interesting when it comes to those issues. And you know what's cool? We welcome the disagreement. Unlike in church, everybody has to think the same. Because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, there should be no divisions among you. Let everyone think with one mind, right? Was that 1 Corinthians, John? Uh, I think it was, yeah. It's been so long, I'm starting to forget where stuff, stuff was from. Um, 
So John said yesterday when I walked in the room, he got nervous. Now I'm nervous because there's another Bible scholar sitting in the back there. So if I, if I get a verse wrong, you'll, you'll correct me, right? Do it, yeah. Just pop up and say, you got it wrong. Uh, so yeah, Paul said, uh, there should be no division among you. So, and he, he neglected to tell his readers, by the way, who got to pick who, who had the view that you didn't have any divisions with. But, uh, but look at the Bible. Paul also said, God is not the author of confusion, but can you think of a book that's caused more confusion than the Bible? I mean, really, it's just confusing. They're all differing with each other. So it's really neat. Uh, in FFRF, we're not political, and we welcome disagreement. We even welcome disagreement on philosophical issues, which is kind of the health of free thought. We don't have to agree. And we, we can be humble ourselves a bit and say, this is what I really think, but maybe I'm wrong. Show me where I'm wrong. How many religious people say that? Not too many would say, here's what I believe, but I might be wrong. They don't admit that their belief is a matter of probability. To them, it's 100%, right? They don't, they don't have the humility or the scientific outlook to say that I'm rounding up from a certain level of probabilities. They just say it's 100%. I know for sure, a lot of them. There are some apologists who will take a more, um, a more humble approach. So anyway, it's fun working for state church separation. We uh, just expanded our building in downtown Madison, Wisconsin. We're two blocks from the state capitol there on a prime corner with a view of the capitol on a corner that we got back in 1990 for a pretty good deal, back when the market was pretty low. And uh, we paid cash for the building and we paid cash for the remodeling. We now quadrupled our space. We have seven full-time attorneys working for us right now. Five of them are permanent. So there, there's five really nice offices now. Before that, our attorneys didn't have offices, except Rebecca had kind of an office. They were just working on these little desks kind of beside a couch, you know what I mean? It was like. And they weren't complaining. They love the work. Uh, we get to sue the government. Now, <laughs> and Annie Laurie, one of Annie Laurie's favorite sayings is, there's nothing more fun than suing the government. Uh, I would say there's nothing more fun than suing the government and winning, because when you win, it's really pretty exciting. We have some great lawsuits, some great victories uh, recently, too, to talk about. So we also have two additional full-time attorneys right now who are on fellowships, which means it's a year long, and we might renew the fellowship. And I think they want to work full time. They want to work permanent as well, because how many jobs like that are there in the country to be able to work full time for state church separation? It's a pretty rare thing. The ACLU has some really great attorneys working on that as well, but they do other work besides that. Uh, a lot of the other groups, uh, Center for Inquiry, American Atheists, American Humanists and other groups also have legal departments. Um, but I think it can be said that FFRF is taking the lead in the number of lawsuits and the number of victories. We usually have about 12 cases in the courts, but we don't focus on the cases in the courts. We focus on non-litigation victories, meaning we send a letter to a principal or a school superintendent or a mayor or a governor pointing out that what you're doing is unconstitutional and you should stop it. Sometimes they stop, which is wonderful. Sometimes they'll get our letter and go, oh, I didn't know this was wrong. Then we're going to stop this. Isn't that neat? No lawsuit, no legal activity, just a letter or two. And then they'll, they, they'll either stop because they realize what they're doing is wrong or more likely they stop because they don't want to get sued and spend all this money. Right. And in a lot of our letters, we will point out, by the way, this Jesus painting you have in this Kansas school, we sued in Ohio over the same Jesus painting. And it finally came down, but it cost them $90,000 before it came down. So the Kansas school is thinking, hmm, do we want to spend all this money on a Jesus painting on the wall? Let's take it down. So that happens. And that's wonderful when it happens. Any one of these victories that we get, non-litigation, without even going to court, any one of them could have been a lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court. Like the McCollum case was just some kids that were asked to sit out in the hallway during Bible instruction because they were not religious. You know, is that a big deal? That, that a couple of kids had to come out of the classroom and sit in the hall while they were teaching the Bible? It doesn't seem like a big deal, but it was a big enough deal to go all the way to the Supreme Court. The McCollum decision in 1948 is now established precedent, which we use a lot. So if you see something in your schools or in your government or in your city or wherever, um, say something. In fact, we're going we're gonna to come up with a new brochure that says, if you see something, say something. Because sometimes people let these abuses go on too long without challenging them. 
So it's pretty exciting. Uh, our new building also has a, a fourth floor auditorium with a brand new Steinway Grand Piano. And uh, I have to say, nonprofit organizations should not be extravagant. You know, like, the, you know, like these churches that have these jets and these gold-plated toilets, you know what I mean? They're spending all this money on this stuff. Well, we're a nonprofit, and, and if you give money to our group, you don't want to see us like spending it extravagantly. You want us to do the job, right? You don't want to say, oh, only 20% of my dollar is going to the cause. We have consistently, uh, for many years in a row from Charity Navigator, have earned the highest four-star rating because we concentrate on um, program. And so our overhead is, is relatively very low. But a brand new Steinway Grand Piano, doesn't that seem kind of extravagant? A concert grand piano? Uh, it does seem extravagant, except uh, a woman in Arizona donated money. She said, Dan should have a good, because I'm a pianist. Dan should have a good piano in that building. I'm going to donate money for that purpose. So in the nonprofit world, if somebody donates money to an organization for a specific purpose, you have to spend it on what they donated it on. You can't divert it. Like if you gave money for one cause, and we spend it on something else, that's, that's illegal, that's wrong, it's violating the public trust. So, I had no choice. <laughs> I had to go into the Steinway store and pick out a Model A concert grand piano for our building. I'm sorry, I, I had to do that. <laughs> and uh, we have Diane's picture on the piano because she donated the piano for that purpose. Uh, Anyway, uh, come and visit us and see our expanded headquarters. Uh, we now have room for everything and admin staff. The whole second floor is uh, legal. And our radio show is produced in the Stephen Yule Friendly Atheist Studio in our own building now, which is cool. And we're almost done with the design for a TV studio next to that. So we just got the walls painted the right color and we have a, a set designer coming in. We'll be able to produce video and TV in a really nice situation. Plus, we get calls from the media all the time. And you might have seen a local story where one of our attorneys is quoted. And you know on TV, you see the square and then they're, they're talking from, from a remote location. We'll be able to do that even through Skype. We can hook up Skype through our TV camera and have a really nice interview with much better quality than you see. Sometimes those Skype things look really crappy, you know, because it's, you know, and the sound isn't good. So we're going to have a little Skype station. So when anybody, any of us get called for a media interview, we can just go right up there and sit down and it looks really good. So uh, come and visit us. You'll like, uh, it, it's just a fun place to visit and a fun place to be. And you heard about my story. Um, I tell my story in the book Godless, how an evangelical preacher became one of America's leading atheists. And uh, in the foreword to the book, Richard Dawkins writes, Dan was not just a preacher. He was the kind of preacher you would not want to sit next to on a bus. <laughs> and if you had known me when I was to college age, when I was in my early 20s and stuff, you would not have liked me. I was that guy on campus who was always out with the Bible preaching that Jesus loves you. You know how overconfident they are and how they sometimes get tears in their eyes because they really care about you and, and Jesus loves you and don't you want to live, live forever with your Lord? And uh, I, I thought I was doing you a great service. I thought I was meeting this need that you had, and, and why would you not want to know this, right? Why would you be afraid of the really good news of the gospel? Well, I tell the whole story about that and why I changed my mind. Last year, I had a book come out called Life Driven Purpose. Do you get it? Some of you know about Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Well, this book takes Rick Warren and turns it upside down because I don't think there is a purpose of life which is good news. It's better than the good news of the gospel. There's no top-down, please tell me what my purpose and plan is for my life. I think that's totally wrong and demeaning and pathetic that people think they have to live their lives by some commanding officer or some plantation owner telling the slaves, what, here's what you must do. I think there is purpose in life, not purpose of life. And it comes from bottom up, from living our own lives. So uh, I'm hoping... I, this probably won't happen, but I'm really hoping to debate Rick Warren on this issue someday uh, about purpose-driven life. But the new book, which is what I want to talk about today, with my um, religion. It's kind of like church. You go into this building and you pay way too much money for a little bit of mind alteration, you know. Um, so Starbucks is my new church, I guess. It's a... Uh, mm. 
So this book is kind of an accident. I wasn't thinking of writing it because I was in the middle of finishing this and this was delayed for a while because the previous publisher turned it down thinking they would get sued by Rick Warren, who does sue people, by the way. And so Kurt Vulcan over at Pitchstone jumped at it and he said, let's do this. Let's sue us. Bring it on. Let's sue. Wouldn't that be great publicity if Rick Warren sued us for this? <laughs> well, he won't. But wouldn't it be great if he did? It would be, it would be cool. But so um, right in the middle of that in 2014, uh, Richard Dawkins, and you all know who Richard Dawkins is, right? The famous biologist and probably the leading atheist in the world right now. He sent me an email saying that he was working on a um, keynote presentation. So, you know, there's keynote and there's PowerPoint, right? So keynote is like Mac. So we both use Macs. It's kind of like Protestants versus Catholics, you know, which, which, which system do you use, you know? <laughs> Although we've never had any holy wars yet over that, have we yet? Haven't had anybody, like the 30 Years War, which was started to a large degree because of the confessional differences between uh, Catholics and Protestants over things like infant baptism and transubstantiation and all that. Um, I don't think there's been any keynote PowerPoint wars yet. But um, Richard Dawkins sent me an email saying that he's having to defend himself uh, against one sentence that he wrote in his book, The God Delusion. And most of you read The God Delusion, right? Um, in fact, this is the 10th anniversary. This October will be, will be the 10th anniversary of the God Delusion. When Annie Laurie and I were in Iceland back in 2006 in the summer, uh, Richard Dawkins was there, and he was very humble. He said, I got a new book coming out. It's going to be called The God Delusion. And, um, and we kind of heard about it, and we knew it'd be kind of, it would be kind of a good book, at least among us non-believers. And he said, I have one extra copy of the manuscript that I'm sending to the publisher. Would you like to have it? So he gave us a copy of the manuscript, not the book book, but the manuscript. Um, and I have seen visitors to my office breaking the Tenth Commandment as they look at that <laughs> manuscript on my shelf, <clears throat> uh, signed by Richard Dawkins. Um, and uh, so we got to read it. It was like a sneak preview. We got to read The God Delusion on the plane coming home. and said, this is really cool. We didn't realize at the time that, it would, that not only would it be a, good, a big book for atheists and agnostics, but it would be such a big blockbuster all over the world. This new atheism thing was coming up and post 9-11 and all that. So uh, Richard Dawkins has been heavily criticized as being strident and contentious and angry. You know, you hear that all the time. Why are you atheists so angry? And I think what's happening, I think it's projection. Psychologists will tell you that... Uh, if something you hear makes you feel angry, you project your anger back on the person you, and you say, why are you so angry? When that person is not, but you think they are because it makes you angry. So the God delusion has got some, some persuasion in it and some passion, some strong arguments, but it's not contentious and strident and angry. If you read it, it's just pretty basic, solid reasoning, except for one sentence. And Richard Dawkins said that this one sentence of his has been more criticized than anything else he's ever written, uh, and he's trying to defend himself against it. It's in, uh, did you bring your God delusions with you today? Turn with me to chapter 2, <laughs> verse 1, the first sentence of the God delusion. It says, see if I can quote it, um, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And uh, you've seen that quote. I'm sure you've all seen it online. And he says it a lot in his speeches. He reads that quote to a lot of laughter, especially when you get to the word fiction. Um, in fact, I was at Tucson Festival of Books uh, last week, and a little boy, like 10 years old, came over and he read the title of this book, God, the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Ah, and he grabbed his mom over and they bought a copy because they thought it was so funny. So anyway, um, so Richard uh, sent an email back in 2014 saying he wanted to make a PowerPoint slide. I mean, a keynote slide, excuse me. Um, we don't want to be heretical here. A keynote slide where uh, he, he called it a spider diagram. 
where the middle of the spider would be the God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Then there would be 19 legs going out. Um, and so with each of those 19 nasty characteristics is in that long sentence. So you could click on the leg that says uh, ethnic cleanser and up would pop the verse. You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land for I have given you the land to possess, right? Plus a bunch more Bible verses from the Old Testament proving that in fact the God of the Old Testament was or is and or is a, an ethnic cleanser. So I thought, okay, this is cool. This is fun. So we were going through it, each of these 19, and after a while, um, the list got really long. It was more than 1,500 verses when you totaled them all up. And uh, in uh, June of that year, Richard Dawkins says, this is really great stuff, but it's not all going to fit on a slide. And I said, well, why don't you just pick like the 10, the 10 best for each, right? And, he, and then he said, you know what? This would make a good book. Get it? Pun intended. The good book. He said, this would make a good book. He said, why don't you publish a book that has one chapter for each of those adjectives to demonstrate what the God of the Old Testament was like. And uh, it's kind of funny because as we were going through it and I was sending him the list and stuff, he was sometimes cautioning me to tone it down. <laughs> and he said, you know what? You should cut some of those because... We don't want to appear like we're overreaching, you know what I mean? You don't want to just throw everything in there because maybe some of those verses could be interpreted in a way that they don't fit. He was suggesting cut this one, cut that one, and then, you know, don't use that phrase. I mean, so here's this strident, angry atheist trying to calm things down. Um, so um, it, I think the Old Testament is kind of like, uh, you know, when you install a new app on your device, and then you get to the terms and conditions. What do you do? You just scroll down to the bottom and you hit accept, right? Do you read it? Do you ever read the terms and conditions? Maybe one sentence or two. How do you know what you're accepting? Maybe there's a clause in there that says, I bequeath all my worldly goods to ISIS, you know, or something. How do you know that's not in there unless you read it, right? Uh, you kind of just trust, right? You just trust that the people who put it together knew what they're doing. So a lot of believers just trust the Bible. It's the good book. It's, God, it's the Word of God. In the Old Testament, I don't read that stuff. Whoever does, maybe, you, you know, Noah's Ark and maybe, uh, uh, what's some other story? What, what stories come to your mind from the Old Testament? I bet you could think of less than 10 stories, right? What are some others? Adam and Eve. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah. Jonah. Jonah. Job. Job, yeah. Joseph. Walking on water is not in there. Elijah and the bears. Elijah and the bears, okay. So that's about, what, eight maybe? I mean, we can all think of a few, right? But what else, what else is in that huge ocean, murky? You know, I found myself wading through this ocean of verses again after all these years of, uh, of doing the dirty work of actually reading through it. And uh, I was shocked. I used to preach from the Bible. I used to preach from every one of these books. And I was reading stuff that I said... This can't be in the Bible. Wait a minute. I never heard a sermon about this. This is in Jeremiah chapter 13, for example, when the Babylonians are asking God, why, I mean, the Israelites, excuse me, the Israelites are asking God, why are the Babylonians attacking us? Why? And God says, well, the Babylonians, I'm allowing them to attack you because you have been disobedient to me. You've been a cheating wife. And that comes up a lot in the Old Testament, this sexual imagery of the wife and the, you're a fornicator, you're whoring after other gods. And there's all this horrible stuff about sex and as if the guys who wrote the Old Testament were sexually frustrated men who wanted to control their women, you know, which maybe was true. It probably was true. Um, and so God says, the reason the Babylonians are attacking you, Israelites, is because you've, you have disobeyed me. And so I want you to know. The, the Babylonians are going to come to you and they will attack you and they will lift up your skirts. You know what that means in the context of war? What does that mean? What happens to women during the context of war? So the Babylonians are coming to lift up your skirts. And if you look at different English translations, some of them say uh, your skirts are lifted up and you are violated and so on. So you can see that that really was a sexual assault that was being, you know, being uh, put on the Israelites. And the Good News Bible, if you read the Good News Bible, it has the good news that 
Your skirts have been lifted up and you have been raped. So obviously, in the context of war, God was saying, these Babylonian men are coming to rape your women because you have disobeyed me. But it goes on to say, when this happens to you, I myself am lifting up your skirts. In other words, God's taking credit for sexually assaulting and raping women. I didn't know that was in the Bible. You want to know one reason why I didn't know that? Because in the King James Version, you don't see it. The King James, if you're reading through Jeremiah 13, in the King James it says, the Babylonians have attacked you and your heels were made bare. What does that mean? Your heels were made bare. Which, a couple of translations say that. Which was a, which was a euphemism or, or at the time for sexual assault, you know, the way they spoke about things. So even Annie Laurie Gaylor, my wife, who's written books about misogyny and the treatment of women in the Bible, she missed that verse. Because in the King James it says your heels were made bare and then she just kept reading. What does that mean, right? So here's the God of the Bible threatening and taking credit for raping women. I didn't know that was in the book. I, that was, you know, and this gets worse than that. Places where God is talking about um, the fruit of your womb that comes between your legs, you will bend down and you will eat the flesh of your offspring. You think, why is that in the good book? I mean, just horrible stuff. Uh, so anyway, um, I finished the basic 19 chapters of the book and we finally found a publisher. One publisher changed their mind on it and Sterling Publication, which is owned by Barnes & Noble, they jumped at it. And they're happy now because it's, it's been a successful book for them. In fact, last week it went into its third printing, which is pretty rare for a book within 10 weeks of the publication date. So they're pretty excited. Um, so as I was doing the research though, I discovered that Richard Dawkins had missed a few more adjectives. So I don't think he missed them. I think he probably thought 19 was enough, right? I mean, right? Because well, you can't say it all. And so he didn't say anything wrong. So part one of this book is Dawkins was right. Part two of the book is Dawkins was too kind. I come, have eight more chapters that he forgot, including pyromaniacal. I was surprised at how much flamethrowing and scorching there is throughout the Old Testament. I knew there was a few places where cities were burned and Sodom and Gomorrah and such, and then the fire coming on the altars. But there's burning, 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 fire flaming all through it, and it was one of the longest chapters of the book, actually. Uh, angry was another one that he missed. And, and it's comical because the writers of the Old Testament describe God in these almost comic book characters, the furious sword fighter. My sword will swing to the right, and my sword will swing to the left. And it's almost like he's one of these action hero people coming to kill all the infidels. And uh, God is a fire-breathing dragon. Fire comes out of his mouth. And it even says fire of brimstone, really bad breath, I think, you know, if you were to come up to that kind of a... Uh, he's like fire like a volcano. Uh, pyromaniacal, angry, um, merciless, because you hear God is a God of mercy. Over and over he says, no, I will not forgive. I will not show mercy. I will not show pity even to the young babies. <clears throat> um, curse hurling. Um, vaxicidal. Do you know what that word is? No. Vaxicide. You know the word vaccine, right? Vaxicidal is the killing of cows. But uh, there doesn't seem to be a word for the general killing of animals. Uh, so I'm using vaxicidal because of the disrespect for animal life that you find all through the Old Testament. And anybody who is in for anybody who cares about animal rights should throw away the Bible because it's not. It's uh, it's horrible. Um, aborticidal. There are a few passages in the Old Testament where God actually threatens that um, the pregnant women shall be ripped open. Not to mention the flood. Right during the flood, there had to be some pregnant women. Right, so there had to be some fetuses that were also drowned in the flood. Uh, aborticidal. Uh, what did I miss one? Um, well, uh, slave monger. Slavery in the Bible as well. So there's eight additional chapters it called Dawkins Was Too Kind that go into greater depth. <clears throat> and um, then there's a final chapter, because what are Christians going to say when you criticize the God of the Old Testament? Yeah, isn't there a kinder, newer Testament now? Didn't Jesus come along and fulfill the law, and now all of that we can just ignore? Of course, the people who say that don't hesitate to put the Ten Commandments in front of their schools, right? I mean, they take the parts of the Old Testament they like and, uh, 
and the rest of the stuff that they don't even read about, they, you know, well, that was then and now is now. And, Jesus, and so I have a chapter called What About Jesus? It's kind of short and it deserves a lot more. Others have done a better job. Hector Avalos in his new book, The Bad Jesus, does a great job of showing that Jesus is not a character we should admire. But basically I show, first of all, that uh, Jesus was not a chip off the old block. Jesus was the old block itself. He said in the New Testament, if you believe the New Testament, okay, you don't have to. You can think Jesus was this, you know, historical character that the New Testament writers exaggerated. But if you take the New Testament itself at face value, Jesus claimed, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When the Jews asked him who he was, he said, before Abraham I was, you know, I'm your father. And the Jews didn't use the word father for God. It's only Christians who use the word father, our father. Uh, the Jews more often thought of him as Lord or husband. You know, in fact, there's places in the Old Testament where God says, I am your husband and you're my wife. So they said, how can you be our father? And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew what he was talking about because in the Old Testament, at the burning bush, when, Ab when uh, Moses asked, you know, who, who am I talking to? Who sent me? He said, tell them that I am has sent you. That word I am is like from the, the Tetragrammaton where we get the word Yahweh. Which, by the way, we don't know what the vowels were. In fact, the word Jehovah is a phony word, too. We don't know what the vowels were because they didn't use vowels. So calling God Yehovah would be like calling a BMW a Bamoa. You know, I mean, it'd be like making up a fake word. Uh, and Jehovah is a fake word, too. So anyway, the Jews, when he said that, they knew what he was claiming. I am God. I'm not just God. Whenever Jesus quoted scripture, what did he quote? the Old Testament scripture. And he quoted it with glowing approval. And he misquoted it a lot. He made it, he twisted it, or his writers twisted it to make it look like it was talking about him when actually it wasn't. For example, when he was asked, what are the greatest commandments? And Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul. Doesn't that sound kind of positive and uplifting? You know, that's the greatest commandment. The New Testament says, forget all those 631, oh, now you just love the Lord your God. And a lot of Christians, and when I was a preacher, I used to think, yeah, okay, that's cool. It's simpler and the kinder Jesus, the New Testament. But when Jesus said that, he was quoting the Old Testament. He was quoting Deuteronomy. And when you go back and look at that quote that Jesus was quoting and look at it in context, where does that quote come from? It comes from a, we could call it a pep rally or a, the big covenant of God with his people before they go in to invade the promised land because he's making this love nest for his own lover that's going to be their own, to commit ethnic cleansing and genocide and kill them all and clear out the whole area so that you can, people can have your own promised land. God said, you're going to go into cities that you did not build. You're going to harvest plants that you did not plant yourself. You're going to live there and you're going to drive out. All, but let me warn you something. When you get there and you invade the promised land with genocide and killing and invasion, don't be tempted by the gods of that land. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. Right? And if you don't, here's all the curses that will happen to you. What if you went to a wedding today where the minister said, so do you promise to love and honor, obey the, your husband for your whole life? I do. And if you ever cheat on him, here's all the curses that will happen to you. I will poke your eyes out with a poker and I will spread cow poop on your face and I will tear your hair out. And I... I'm not making this up. The Bible actually says that stuff. Cow dung spread on the face of the lover who looks at another man. Like some insecure lover or husband who does, if, if the woman even looks sideways at another man, you slut, you whore. You know that attitude of some of these men who think they possess and control their lover? Well, God was saying that to his own people. When you go into the promised land, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't look at those others. In other words, those were words of a genocidal, possessive, jealous husband over a wife that he wanted to control. That's what Jesus was quoting in the New Testament when he said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart. Look at, you know, Christians are always telling us, you should look at the context, right? Well, let's do that. Let's look at the context. And um, love your neighbor as yourself was the second one that he said. And if you look in the context of that, Loving your neighbor, the verse that he was quoting, the word neighbor, you know what that word neighbor meant? Yeah, it meant your fellow Israelite. And it even says, your kin in the, in the, in the uh, 
kin of your kin. The, your neighbor basically is your own people. You should love your own people like yourself. Well, every group does that, right? Big deal. Jews love Jews and Hindus love Hindus. It's just a tribal thing that we all have to love our own neighbor. That word neighbor did not mean neighboring tribes and neighboring villages. In fact, he goes on to say, when you attack one of those neighboring cities out there, he says, offer it terms of peace. The word is shalom. You and I think the word peace. You know, most religions talk about peace, right? Uh, and Jesus talked about peace. And so we think, oh, how nice. This religion talks about peace. That word shalom, you know what it actually meant? It didn't mean what you and I think it means. You and I think peace means like, let's all get along and love each other and put aside our differences, right? But that's not what peace meant in the Bible. Peace in the Bible meant pacification. Just like they were living, Christians were living under the Pax Romana. So they were, in one way, the New Testament was more gentle because there weren't any of these big genocidal wars because the Romans achieved world peace, which meant a military imperialistic peace. You'll have peace on earth when all your threats have been subdued and there's no challenge to your authority. That's when there's peace on earth. So it was a very violent concept. So in, in the Old Testament, when God said, you're going to attack these villages afar off, they treated the local villages different, but the ones afar off offer it terms of peace, shalom. If they don't accept your terms of peace, then you either kill them or turn them into slaves. That's what peace meant in the Bible. Peace meant no threat to the big alpha male authority. Now we have peace on earth because I'm in control. Everybody loves me and me only. That's what it meant. Kind of like the football player who's trying to impress the cheerleaders and, you know, I am the big one. Oh, don't look at the, I'm going to conquer all of those. And that's what the God of the Bible is. He's a big, jealous, alpha male bully. And I tell a bunch of stories that prove each one of those points. How much time do we have here? Oh, about 10 minutes. Um, uh, what's one, one quick example? Uh, when I went to the Tucson Festival of Books um, last week, uh, we walked past the Gideon International booth to get to our, our secular humanist booth. And they, they come out and they stick Bibles at you. They stuck a Bible out to us and I said, oh, no, thanks. We're headed to the atheist booth. And he said, atheist, we should have a theological discussion. And I said, yeah, we should. But then we left. But then I went back about an hour later to get some ice cream and I walked by it and he stuck a Bible out in front of me again. And, I, and he said, this is the best selling book in all history. And I said, yeah, but it's the least read book in all history, too. It might be the best selling, but who reads it? Nobody reads it. Have you read it? And he said, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Have you read the whole thing? And he said, I've read the whole thing. I said, well, really? Well, then uh, explain to me the story of Pinehas. And he looked at me like, what? The story of Pinehas, you've read the whole thing, right? Would well, you think Pinehas was a good man? And he looked at his friend. I said, well, do you know the story of Pinehas? You guys are telling everybody to read the Bible. And he said, well, I haven't memorized the whole thing, right? And uh, so I told him the story of Pinechas. And I said, I want you to tell me if, this, if Pinechas is a good man. So uh, the Israelites had some neighboring, a neighboring tribe called the Midianites. And the Midianites technically were descended from Abraham too, from another wife. But the Midianites were like kissing cousins. They didn't worship uh, Yahweh. They worshiped Baal Peor. They worshiped another god. And so... Yahweh said to the Israelites, don't mix with those Midianites. They're evil. It's evil. And by the way, in the Old Testament, most of the time you see the word evil and wicked, it has nothing to do with moral behavior. It almost always has to do with worshiping another god or building an idol or doing some ritualistic abomination or, um, or not obeying God. So, so God told the Israelites, don't mix with them, don't marry with them, have nothing to do with those evil Midianites because they don't worship me, the jealous real God, right? But you know what happens, especially with neighboring tribes, there's intercourse in all senses of the word going on. And some of the Israelite men were marrying some of the beautiful Midianite women. Why not, right? Uh, in this country, we don't have any prohibition against any interracial or interethnic marriage, right? It's a, you know, that's freedom. But in God's time, you should not do that. It's part of the chapter on racism as well. Uh, and ethnic cleansing, Just keep away from them. So some of them were, were mixing with the Midianites, so God caused this horrible plague to happen, and he said, take all the leaders of the tribes, take their heads and hang them on a pole for everybody to see. He was really angry that, some, that his lover was cheating on him, basically. He was really angry about this. And so 
right in the middle of all this plague and death and this threat about mixing with the Midianites, uh, there was a man named Cosby, an Israelite, who fell in love with a Midianite woman named Zimri, and they, they got married. And he brought her in front of everybody. He brought her into his tent, an interracial marriage. So Pinehas was the grandson of the high priest Aaron. He was also a Levite. He was a priest. So Pinehas saw this happen. He saw this Israelite marrying this non-Israelite woman, bringing, him, bringing her into the tent. So what did he do? He picked up a sword and he rushed into the tent and he stabbed them both through the belly and killed them both. Was that a good thing? I asked this guy. I asked the guy, was that a good thing for Pinehas to do? And he didn't want to answer it. He wanted to say, well, let me ask you a question. I said, but I want to ask you just a simple moral question about a book that you're telling me to read, right? He didn't want to answer it. And I said, do you think it was a good thing to do? Because God did. God rewarded Pinehas. He said, God praised Pinehas for keeping the people pure. Talk about racial purity. Talk about a master race that's racially pure. God rewarded and praised Pinehas for being an example of keeping the Israelites pure from those evil neighbors. And he rewarded Pinehas with a perpetual priesthood forever. What would we do to somebody today who did something like that? Suppose an American man went and found some Buddhist woman and brought her and then converted to Buddhism. And some priest were to go in and say, that's horrible, and would go and kill them. What would, we, what would we call that? A hate crime of the highest degree, right? Would we reward that person? Would we give them a perpetual priesthood? But God did. And then he stopped the plague at, I forget the exact number, 24,000, I think. He stopped the plague because now Pinechas did this thing that showed that the Israelites had to be racially pure and not mixed with foreigners, right? And in fact, one of the two men at that Gideon's booth was a, a big, tall black guy. And I, a I asked him, uh, do you think... Um, do you think it is uh, right to murder an interracial couple? Do you think that's a good thing to do? And he said, let me ask you a question. They wouldn't want to, none of them wanted to answer the question. They didn't know the Bible. They didn't know what their own book says. They were not prepared to morally defend the actions of the God of their own Bible, of their own good book. And he kept, they kept evading the question so much that I said, I've got things to do. Uh, you guys obviously don't have any moral judgment at all. Your religious views have compromised your moral judgment. You don't know how to actually ethically analyze what's in your own book because you're blinded by your, like an, like an abused wife who's got this abusive macho husband. Sometimes they'll call the police, but then she'll change her mind. My dad was a police officer. He said it happened a lot. They'd get a call for domestic violence, but then the wife would turn on the police because, wait a minute, that's my husband. And what else is she going to do? She's got a place to live and her husband is her Lord. So this, that mentality happens a lot, and I think that happens in religion. I think a lot of religious people are blinded by the fact that their Lord is this, the Lord is a good Lord. And that's what an abused wife will tell her husband. You're a good man. Yes, I love you. You're a good man. Don't beat me up again, right? And that's kind of what the mentality is in religion in, in the Bible. So um, I don't have time. I could tell the story of Samson's wedding, which is really weird. Samson's wedding, it's just, it's like... <laughs> like something out of a dark action comic book, you know? I mean, it's like, I don't know. Um, or um, the story of Korah's Rebellion. Do you know that story? I know John knows all those stories, Scott, because you used to preach them, right? Korah was the first Protestant. He challenged the authority of Moses. He, Korah did what Martin Luther did. Martin Luther went to the Pope and said, how come God only speaks to you and not to us people? Why can't God speak straight to us? And today... Uh, a lot of churches, including some Baptist churches, have this doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, that God, we don't need intermediaries. And that was a big part of the, the, uh, um, you know, the Protestant um, Reformation, was that we each can talk to God directly. But Korah was raising that question with Moses. A good question, right? Moses, who gave you the authority? Why, why do we have to wait for you to tell us what God said? Why can't God talk to us? And you know what happened to Korah? Should I tell the answer? Some of you know what happened to Korah, right? No? If this were a movie, you would need stupendous, you know, special effects. Like that movie, uh, Andreas Fault, San, San Andreas. You would need this stupendous, you know. Um, Korah and his 250 followers were standing there asking Moses a sensible question in a country that did not have freedom of speech or to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The earth split open. <laughs> 
and Korah and all of his followers. Fat, you knew the answer, John? Is that right? I wasn't sure. I told him that I was right. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> so the earth opens up, and Korah and 250 of his followers, they all, and all their family in their tents, they all fall down into Talk about a surgical strike, you know. And then the earth goes and crushes against them. And then Moses said, so there. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> um, his authority was challenged. And what do, what do people like popes and people, what do they do when their authority is challenged? John Calvin did the same thing when Servetus challenged his authority. He actually had Servetus burned at the stake with Servetus' book tied to his body with green woods. And it was horrible. People in religious authority have this idea that I am not to be questioned. So, but the next day, some of the other Israelites who watched this scene, some of them were kind of grumbling like, wait a minute, you just killed our own people. Shouldn't we be saving our forces because we're going to invade the promised land. That's where we need to fight. We don't need to fight each other. And so they said to Moses, Moses, why are we fighting each other? That was, you know, that didn't, that seemed kind of heavy handed, don't you think, to do something like that? So do you think Moses responded in a kindly manner to that? He, a huge plague came and killed, now I forget the number again, 20,000, I mean thousands. I mean, you know, you know it's a fiction because these numbers could not have happened. There could not have been 20,000 people killed like that and, uh, and all that. Anyway, so uh, the first Protestant, I'm surprised that more Protestants don't join me in denouncing that story about Korah, right? That would, that would be something that Protestants should be saying, just like Martin Luther said to the Pope. And the Pope at that time had the power, not to open the earth, but it had the power. The government had the power then to squash dissent, the inquisitions and, uh, and all those things that they did. So, uh, so you'll read about some of those stories in here. God, the most unpleasant character in all fiction. And um, I, I end it with a final chapter, which is just one page called an afterword, which... Um, shows what God will do in the final day of God's judgment. And it's, it's curses and horrible desolations that are come for those of us who don't believe in this God. So uh, you'll have to decide for yourself whether you think the God of the Bible is good or whether the Bible itself is a good book. And if you ever do get in, in any conversations with people who think it's a good book, just bring up a couple of those stories. Bring up the story of the sacking of Saul, for example, which is a really interesting story. Um, well, I won't talk about that today. There's, it's, in a perverse kind of way, it's fun to tell these stories because they're all there. and they're all, When you open the hotel drawer in your hotel room, there's the Bible there to read it. Does anyone read it? Do you actually read any of these horrible stories, the misogynies in the Psalm 137, 9 that says you should be happy to take innocent babies and dash them against the stones? The Bible doesn't say... Uh, there might be some regrettable collateral damage during wartime where infants might have to be killed. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, happy shall he be, or in some translations, is blessed. When that happens, you should be happy about that. Do you know any people who would be happy to take up babies and dash? Well, you maybe know one or two, maybe. I don't know. But um, to take a baby, an innocent baby, and dash it against the stones. Uh, and the uh, killing of the firstborn of the 10th plague of Egypt, which raises the question, by the way, what was the point of the first nine plagues of Egypt? If God knew that the 10th plague would do the trick, and the point of it, it's in the chapter bully, God was showing off, and he kept even saying that. After the sixth plague, Pharaoh relented and said, okay, let the people go. Did you know that? Pharaoh said, let them go. So you can't blame Pharaoh for the last four plagues. And what did God say? God hardened his heart because I have more signs to show you. In other words, he had a bag of tricks. He must have had ten fingers. Ten commandments, right? Ten plagues. He must have been like the people who wrote the book. He must have, they must have been counting. Oh, they have to be ten plagues. I'm not done yet. I've got... So um, on the tenth plague, which did the trick, it was really like a cat with a mouse. It was like... Wait a minute, I got more. I'm not going to eat you yet. Wait, I got to do one more thing. You got, and then the world will know that I am God. I will show you my power and everybody will know that I am great. That's what you call, that's what a bully is. It's not just kicking somebody in taunting. It's like using words of superiority. Oh, I'm great. You're nothing. Say uncle. Ah, so um, um, every year at Passover, uh, the Jews are celebrating the, the death of the bad innocent children instead of the good innocent children, which were there, the chosen innocent children. Uh, it's a horrible book, and I think most Christians, and I think we should say this, 
we as atheists should say most Christians and Jews and Muslims are good people. They really are. Most of them have risen above this book. But how do you know what we've risen above unless we know it? I mean, we can see what we have risen above. Most of them will join me in denouncing a lot of these stories. And, but you've got to know the story before you denounce them. So that's God, the most unpleasant character in all fiction. By the way, the word fiction is right on the cover. It's not, it's, it, Dawkins and I are not mad at some God who does exist. We're mad at a God who doesn't exist, but a lot of people believe in the existence of that God. Do we have time for questions, or should we quit here? Um, I think I'm out of time. One question? Yeah. That's the Gideon Bible. Yeah? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read, I think I quoted one of the people who was like, wasn't Gideon a horrible person himself? Didn't he, didn't he, uh, to yeah. People yeah. Read the story about Gideon. We have some Bible stickers that we put on hotel Bibles. On the outside it says, warning, literal belief in this book may endanger your health and life. But on the inside we have it. Please read the story of Gideon about how he killed his, his own 70 sons, right? And uh, how he has all these wives and concubines. And he was not somebody that we would elect to be dog catcher in our country. I mean, really. So yeah, he was, and they're using that name Gideon as if it was a great example because Gideon blew the trumpet and then, the, you know, he was supposedly a great that's military how, hero. That's how I approach this guy. So why would you hand out a book that seems to be honoring a man who <laughs> committed horrible yeah. murders? Yeah. And they didn't really have an answer. But. Yeah, well, because they don't read it. They just yeah. scroll down to the bottom and they hit accept and they, they're surprised when you mention these stories. Even I was surprised as a former preacher. I bet there are some stories in here, John, that you'd be surprised about. You'd probably say, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Because it's like, how, there's so much. It's this big sprawling octopus of stuff that, do we pay attention to all of it? Or do we go to the Bible as a sort of a sermon text? We look for a couple of verses that we can use for our Sunday morning sermon to give some message of love and hope to the world. And we ignore all that other stuff that's in there. Yeah, question here? In the world of apologetics, where a lot of the things that we take as very sensible reactions to Bible stories or concepts of the Bible, uh, there's a lot of sources where we can go either online or in books to see the breakdown or maybe a counter argument. Would you uh, have a recommendation of a good start for people who are looking for <coughs> counter apologetics to have these discussions with people who maybe are a bit studied? Well, when it comes to the Bible, um Steve Wells' site is pretty good. Um, Skeptics Annotated Bible. You can go on there and look at contradictions and look up things. And in fact, I credit Steve Wells in here um, for some of that research actually that he's done. Um, and nowadays with the internet and online, you can pretty much search for anything. And anybody with an opinion is out there about something. But maybe uh, go to John Loftus' books. He's got, uh, he's got a wealth of stuff uh, that... Uh, touches on a lot of these apologetic issues. And, um, and John and I and others, we do, we do public debates. I just did my 123rd public debate uh, a couple weeks ago in DC, um, meaning before a live audience with a moderator. So 123 of those. And I bet you you've done, what, maybe 50 or so. Um, but um, so uh, you can look at some of those online. And they're on different topics. And 123 debates sounds like a lot, and it is. But the first one was 1985. So that's kind of like four a year, and so they spread out. After a while, you can start adding up the numbers. But uh, I love doing debates. Debates are like, uh, you know, that, this love of talking to a hostile audience. I just love that feeling of uh, having them, knowing they're disagreeing, and saying something that, uh, that I know they're going to take uh, issue with. So, um, yeah, behind there. Last week, the primary happened here for the, uh, in Colombia. Yeah. The primary was in a church. Why was that? Is that not a violation? Um, you, you had to vote in the church, right? Except I didn't. My wife had to vote. Yeah. That happens around the country. Um, and usually it's wrong, but sometimes they can get away with it on a temporary basis. We had to vote in a church um, a couple weeks ago because we had a, a local election uh, for judge. Uh, but we noticed a sign out there that says the regular polling place is under construction right now and we're going to go back to it again. So we can't complain because they're going to go back to it. Uh, and it looked pretty secular when we went in there. 
But if there is a secular place that's adequate to vote, then the city should prefer that. Because if you use a church, then studies have shown, for example, if, if something having to do with abortion is on the ballot and you're voting in a church, you get more people to show up and you get more towards that, that side of the issue. So there's, it's not politically neutral. Churches are not always politically neutral. And uh, especially sometimes you have to walk by a Virgin Mary statue or something before, you, or you see these posters or stuff. That shouldn't happen. Uh, and you can complain about that if it's regular. And you can ask the city uh, or the county or wherever your voting happens, you can ask them to provide a secular location because you're uncomfortable. You can always vote absentee, but you can still complain about that. It shouldn't, shouldn't happen except maybe on a temporary basis. Or maybe if the city makes an argument, there is no other possible place. But there's schools, right? There's schools in the city. There are places where you could have a vote that is not religious. So. Yeah? I have one more question, Pastor. Uh, I, I, your, uh, your legal people, you must have run across this at some time. I was driving through a small town in Nebraska on the way uh, out west, and here in a small town on the courthouse square, there was, I, I didn't do a double day. There was a plaque of Ten Commandments. Right. And it really bothered me. How can they get by with this? So I called up the, I don't know who else to call, the city newspaper, and I said, why does your city allow this? A plaque of Ten Commandments on the courthouse lawn. And she said, well, what happened was the Chamber of Commerce purchased a small little six by six square of land so, that, so they could put that on there. I didn't have an answer. I, I don't know. Have you run across anything like that? Yeah, we have run across it. Uh, we've sued over that very issue. And sometimes they move it, and sometimes they sell the land to a private group. And we don't like that. It's a, it's a ruse. It's a way to keep it there. But if they if they've section it off and they put a sign there that this is private property and not government speech, then we can't challenge that. Because... Um, Technically, and in fact, if the city does do that to get around it, they're admitting that it was wrong for the government to be doing that in the first place. So there's a victory there. And even though the Ten Commandments doesn't move, there's a park in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where we sued. And uh, they did the same thing. They sold it to the Lions. There's two fences around it. And there's this big sign that this is now private property. It's in the same place, in the same park, but now it's quote unquote private property. They sold it's like a postage stamp that they sold to to get around keeping it there. So we won the case because the city agreed that it shouldn't be promoting religion. But on the ground we lost the case because it's still there, but now it's private speech. So um, we challenged Ten Commandments in public high schools in Pennsylvania and they're moving those, which is really they fought it and fought it. And we had pictures of they came in the middle of the night with a crane and they picked it up and same thing in, uh, in Oklahoma City on the state capitol grounds. They had to pick up the Ten Commandments and move it as well. So complain. If you see that, you should complain and then ask. Um, there's only one other case uh, situation where a Ten Commandments might be allowed, and that is if it's a smaller part of a larger display. Nativity scenes are the same way. There's a, a really bad decision, and we don't agree with this, but the law is now that if... A religious display is just a small part of a larger display, then you cannot accuse the government of having a religious purpose. It's just a smaller bit. So that's why the Ten Commandments stays in Austin, Texas, because the court decided that that Ten Commandments was part of a huge Texas museum display with all sorts of other things. It's a bad argument. It's a wrong argument, but that's the argument that the courts have given that we have to work with right now. So uh, we use the phrase lynch compliant because it was the lynch decision that allowed the nativity scene. So maybe that, that Ten Commandments monument was a part of some larger big historical display, in which case you could complain, but you couldn't take it to court. So are we out of time or are we? We're out of time. Okay, thank you.